All right, well, good morning. I want to thank everyone for joining us here for worship at Shoal Creek. Please be sure to put hashtag Shoal Creek United and take a picture or a selfie of you and your family worshiping and let us know that you are following with us, singing with us. Like what Brother Ben said, man, take a video of you just singing and worshiping. It's going to be, you know, we got to make the best of this situation. I want to thank every one of you for taking the time to be a part of what we're doing here at Show Creek and for continuing to worship with us. Please uh, keep watch of Facebook as we have so many wonderful ministers here at church with our preschool department, our children's department, our youth department, all striving to put out videos uh, to keep your children growing and learning about Christ. Also, I'm trying to put on devotions as well. We're probably going to have a little Q&A session starting soon as well, just trying to change it up a little bit. So keep watching Facebook for videos uh, and also announcements. Um, we're still trying to see about Easter, and so please stay tuned for that, and we'll give you more details about the uh, Easter giveaway on the go that we're doing. I'm not sure that's the way it was put up there, but regardless, it's on the go. And I'm so looking forward to how we're going to reach out to the community through that. Let's go on and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to be able to gather. I thank you for the ability to be able to put this on the internet so those that cannot be here, those as we're just simply trying to honor our government by uh, keeping a social distance from one another to slow down the spread of this virus. Father, bless this time that we are together. Bless this time as we open up your word and study it, as we lift your name up in song and prayer. We do ask that you will put a halt to the spread of this virus, that you will do a great, mighty, wondrous thing here among us as you slow the spread down. Father, we look forward to how you're going to work and how you're going to move through this entire situation because we know that you are sovereign over all things and everything works out for your good, for your plan. And I ask all this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. It's time to join us in worship.
and I found a stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Shame is a prison as cruel as a grave. Shame is a robber and he's come to take my name. Oh, love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground. Love is a power. 
so much for coming here to the worship team. It is a blessing to at least still have y'all and to be able to look at you when I'm speaking, but also to all our congregation that is joining us via the internet this morning. 
What we've been doing is going through a time where we're studying the gospel of Mark. We're in a series that I've titled simply, To Be Amazed. I want us to be amazed again at who Christ is and what Christ has actually done for us and to get past just that elementary learning of what Christ did in the Gospels, but take a fresh look again and to really dive into all that he said and has done. Last time we were together, we began a study starting with the parables. We had made it up to the parable of the souls. Again, I titled it simply the parable of the souls because that's what the parable is about. It's not so much about the sower or the seed. Uh, The seed is the gospel. It's the souls that are different. And so we focused on the souls. The first soul that we talked about is the hard soul. I'm going to make sure I put the D on that. I was told by several that it sounded like I said heart soul. And I swear there are saved people in heart soul. Not everybody in heart soul has a hard soul heart. Okay? But hard soul Um, That is what I first that Christ began to talk about, and that is the soul that is just really, really hard, the hearts that are really, really hard, and the gospel seed falls upon the hearts, and it just bounces off, or it lays there until the bird, which Christ referred to as Satan, comes and gathers it up before it can take root in their hearts, and that's what Scripture teaches us, that there is a prince and a power of the air, and that what he does is that he blinds our minds to his gospel truth and unless Christ comes upon us and takes that away from us that blinder away from us and opens us up to his gospel truth we would never be awoken we would never be reborn it is him who comes upon us and so we saw the hard soul there the next one we saw was the rocky soul We talked in length about the rocky soil and about how the roots were not able to be established and how important roots truly are. If you're going to survive the hard times in life, if you're going to survive the storms in life, you've got to have roots and your roots have got to be dug deep in the gospel and his word. You've got to already have a fellowship and a body of believers. It's not waiting until the storm comes upon you. Do you need to try to grow in His Word? Or did you need to try to find a faith family? If you don't have any of that, yes, desperately do it. But I promise you the odds of you surviving are not near as good as you would already root yourself in His truth. Root yourself into a faith family. You need to have roots if you're going to survive the droughts, the trials, and the persecutions of life, which is what Christ said is what happens and why the seed did not stay alive there in the rocky soil. The third one was the crowded soil. This is the one where here in America, where we live the American dream, and we are probably the blessed country in all the world. We've got all this stuff around us, and I'll be honest with you, one of the reasons so many of us are struggling, me in particular, with our current crisis and situation is because all these things in our life, they're taking it from us. I don't have my sports that I'm used to. I don't have my gym anymore. I don't have my... Mexican restaurant where I've got my queso dip and I can just sit there and chow down on some queso dip. I'm missing so much of this life that I just don't have anymore. And Christ refers to that as the thorns of this world, the weeds of this world. And we desperately do need a weeding every now and then. He comes to our life and He begins to pull up these things in our life that really and truly takes precedence in our life most of the time. He is to be number one. And a lot of the reasons why we do not bear fruit is because we've got too many weeds and cares and lusts and joys of this world that we put all our attention and focus on and it shadows and covers out Christ in our lives. That's the crowded soil. But he ends with a good soul, and that was probably the greatest blessing of that whole parable. It's the one thing that they would not have really understood when he said it. Because there is no way plants produce 30, 60, 100 fold. That's insane. No plant does that. But it does when Christ is in control. He is going to do a miracle in our lives and a wonderful thing in our lives if we would simply just receive the gospel, accept it and believe it, and allow it to produce fruit in our lives. And it will produce fruit that no mere human being can do. 
It's only what Christ can do through us, that magical, wonderful thing that He does in our lives. That's the good soil. And of all the soils that he talked about, only one of those soils produced fruit. And it's by our fruit that the world will know that we follow Christ. Following that parable, he rattles off a couple more parables. And so we're going to continue talking about these parables. The two that we're going to address today are actually really short. I'm going to title the message this morning, Listen Up. All right, Simply that. Listen Up. The reason why I title it Listen Up is because one of the things you got to do when you study Scripture is you got to look for repeating words. If words repeat, they repeat for a reason. They didn't waste time and paper and ink back then for nothing. They repeat words for a reason. And Christ repeated one thing constantly through these parables. If you got ears, you need to hear. You need to listen. And in our parables today, that's what he's going to do, is draw focus upon those who are actually listening and paying attention to what they listen. And so the message this morning is listen up. It contains a powerful truth, a great promise, and a sobering, a sobering warning. That's what we're going to be today. We're in Mark's Gospel, chapter 4. And so however you got a copy of God's Word, if it's on your phone, a tablet, in book form, however you got a copy of His Word, even if you need to minimize your screen right now and Google Mark chapter 4, do that. Mark chapter 4, verse 21 through 25 is where we're going to be. And I know this might sound strange to you. But I would love if you have the ability to to just stand wherever you are for the reading and the honor of his word, knowing it never returns void, and that faith comes by hearing and hearing of the word of Christ. Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, starting in verse 21, and we're only going to go through verse 25 this morning. And he was saying to them, A lamp is not brought to be put under a basket, is it? Or under a bed? Is it not brought to be put on a lampstand? For nothing is hidden except to be revealed. Nor is anything been secret but that it would come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he was saying to them, Take care what you listen to. By your standard of measure it will be measured to you. And more will be given you besides. For whoever has, to him more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity you've given me to be able to come and to serve as the under-shepherd of this church. But Father, this is your church body. These are your precious children that you saved. I ask that you speak to them now through the power of your Holy Spirit. That you do give them ears to hear and eyes to see your blessed truth this morning. Father, speak to them where they're at. Block out all the things of the world that's trying to distract them right now and allow them to hear your truth today. And it's in Jesus' holy and precious name I pray and ask these things. Amen. You may be seated. One of the things that I found interesting when I was studying this about listening, and we talked about listening last time. We, we discussed Yogi Bear, the ball player of the Yankees, last week. But this week I, I came across an article. It's an article done by the president of the University of Southern California. And he actually refers to three great delusions. He said that almost all Americans have three great delusions. Three great ones. Here's the first one. Most Americans have a great delusion in believing that they are actually a good driver. They think they're good drivers. Now what amazes me about that is that's absolutely true. I've never met one person that will actually honestly look me dead in the eyes and say, I'm a horrible driver. But everybody, when they're on the road, they're talking about all these other people that are terrible drivers. But I ain't never met one that was the terrible driver. The great delusion is this. 
Most of us think we're wonderful drivers. But most of us are not wonderful drivers. Do you know how I know that? Because I've been on the Highway 67. And I've seen some of you drive. And you've seen me drive. And as much as I hate it that people will not use a turn signal when they were put on a car for a reason, I have been guilty of not using my turn signal at times. We have the great delusion of thinking we're good drivers. Here's another one. This is the second great delusion. Most people are delusional when they think that they have a great sense of humor. Most people think they have a good sense of humor. Again, I haven't met many people that will honestly look at you in the face and say, I have no sense of humor whatsoever. Even though I have met some people that have no sense of humor whatsoever. They take everything literal. They don't, they don't understand it. They, they don't understand satire. They, there's so much they miss. Most of them will have what I, they'll refer to as a dry sense of humor. And I've met some people with a really good dry sense of humor. But I've also met people that does, doesn't have a sense of humor, and they say they have a dry sense of humor. No, brother, you just ain't got one. That joker is dried up and died. Go back to the rocky soil parable. The delusional of having a good sense of humor. The third one and the final one is this. Most Americans are delusional because they think they are good listeners. And that's the truth. Most of us really and truly are not good listeners. We focus on too much of the other stuff in the room that's going on. Maybe, maybe their shirt isn't aligned right. And you're just... Your OCD is just a kicking, and you don't hear a word they say, or their hair is out of whack. Something just isn't going right, or maybe they have a list when they speak, and you completely miss everything they're saying. Or maybe they said hard soul, but you heard heart soul. <laughs> you just, we're not the best listeners in the world. Or maybe we're just not good speakers. That's the fourth delusional, and I would add that to that. But not good listeners. I, most of you know my testimony. I've, I've lived a horrible, horrible life for most of my life. Just a horrible person. And there was a time where through just my drunkenness for so long and unfaithfulness that me and my wife were really struggling to keep our marriage together. And we went to a marriage counselor. And there, I mean, she drug me kicking and screaming. I didn't want to go. But she took me to the marriage counselor, and we would go. And what the counselor would do is that he would sit, me and Ashley, down, and we had to talk to one another. And she was allowed to speak to me, and I was not allowed to respond. Could not respond. And as soon as she was done telling me what she had to say, I had to repeat exactly Back to her what she said. And then she had to agree that that's what she said before I could respond. And the whole reason the counselor did that is because most of the time we're not really listening. We're not hearing what they're saying. The whole time they're talking, we're thinking about our counter-argument in our head and we're actually missing what they're saying. The reason I'm going through all that is simply this. If Jesus Christ, the creator and sustainer of the earth, tells you to listen, and he says it multiple times, you need to be listening. You need to crowd out all this stuff that's going on right now in your life. You need to crowd out all that crisis that's happening. You need to cut off the announcements and the alerts on your phone just for a minute or an hour and a half, depending on my sermon, and just listen. Listen to what Christ has to say in this passage, in this parable. And so the first thing I want us to do is to notice the powerful truth. That's number one. He gives us a very powerful truth. Even though these are very short parables, there is something very powerful in it, a lesson for us. We see it in verse 21 where he says, And he was saying to them, A lamp is not brought to be put under a basket is it or under a bed 
Is it not brought to be put on a lampstand? Now, Jesus didn't take time to explain this parable like he did the parable of the souls. The parable of the souls, he broke down every little part and explained it to his disciples. He didn't do it here. Do you know why he didn't do it here? Because it don't take a rocket scientist to figure this one out. It just doesn't. Why do you light a lamp? To let it light up a room. That's the entire purpose of a lamp. You don't have to wonder about what he's trying to say here. It is to expose truth. It is to cast out darkness and allow light to come into a situation. That is what a lamp is supposed to do. Now, lamps back then did not look like lamps today. They looked more like gravy boats. And you simply poured in the oil and you put a wick in one end and you would light the wick. And nobody would take the time to put oil in one of these lamps, light the wick, and then just all of a sudden throw it under a bed or under a basket or cover it up with a blanket. Nobody does that. Number one, it's extremely wasteful. Number two, that's a fire hazard, children. Do not do that at home. Adults, too. Don't test me on that. I'm telling you, it'll catch fire. Nobody does that. This doesn't make sense. And so it becomes obvious what Christ is trying to say. But even in its obviousness, we sometimes miss the real truth in this passage. Because there is real truth, and because of cultural and time distance, sometimes we tend to miss it. Here's the one thing that you really need to know about this light. Jesus Christ is the light. He is the light. The Jews that are listening to Jesus speak this would have known who the light was. The light is always used in reference there to Christ and to God throughout the Old Testament and even in the New Testament. Here are some scriptures to back this up. Genesis chapter 1 verse 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. That was before He made the sun, the stars, and the moon. He said in Revelation 21, 23, and that's the first and the last books of the Bible. In Revelation 21, 23, and the city has no need of a sun or a moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the lamp is the Lamb. Jesus Christ is this light. He is professing again His deity here with simply this statement. In John chapter 8, 12, Jesus said it this way, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So we don't have to guess who the light is. Jesus himself professes to be the light in other gospel accounts. Not only that, at the beginning of John's gospel, chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, it says of this, And of him, speaking of Jesus, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Jesus Christ is the light. We need to have that understood before we can really dive into what he's trying to say here in this parable. So in verse 22 where it says, For nothing is hidden except to be revealed, nor has anything been secret, but that it would come to light. What Christ is explaining here is simply this. No doubt his followers and many people listening to me, especially last week and now, are wondering, why in the world is Jesus speaking in parables? Why don't he just come say out, y'all, I'm God. They would think his parables are confusing, that he's trying to hide things from people. But the truth is, Jesus Christ is not hiding anything. He is speaking through parables for those who are willing to listen and seek out the gospel truth. Those who are willing to hear to it. Because this whole thing is explaining about who he is and how he's revealing himself to the world. Because he is the light. And we, we as those who do hear and believe, we all of a sudden are the ones that are to testify of that light. Because he is the light. Understand this, that's what John the Baptist did. In John, in John chapter 1, verses 6 and 8, it says this, There came a man sent from God, talking about John, whose name was John, and he came as a witness to testify about the light, so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. 
John's job was to simply prepare the world for the coming Messiah. To get everything paved and set up straight just for Jesus to come up on the scene. And now our job on the other side of the cross is to share the truth with this dark world. To share the light of Jesus Christ. We're even referred to as lights. Understanding that the light is not us. It's the light inside us that's Jesus Christ that shines through us. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, Jesus said this, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and he gives it light to all who are in the house. That's almost exactly what Christ is saying in Mark's gospel. He is the light, and we are to shine His light into this dark world. Jesus Christ did not come into Malin's life, radically change my life, so that I can hide in my house and not tell a living soul what Christ has done in me. Jesus Christ didn't save you so that you could hide in your home or at your job or on a ball field and never once share what Jesus Christ has done in your life. We are called to share this wonderful light. To share what Christ has done in our lives. That's why in Matthew chapter 5 verse 16, the next verse, he goes on to say, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. The reason why I go out and I talk about my faith, the reason why I go out and I brag about Jesus and what He's done for me and everyone in this world, that will accept Him in faith. It's because I want my Father to be glorified. I want His kingdom to be enlarged. That is why I go and do what I'm supposed to do. One of the reasons why I love preaching straight through books of the Bible isn't just because I want to make sure I give honor and respect to the text. That, of course, is number one. I don't want to skip a single subject. But one of the cool things about preaching straight through a book of the Bible is watching how God's going to work in it. Do you know that it's absolutely impossible for me to have picked the Gospel of Mark and said, all right, on this date, I want to preach this message about the light in the midst of a pandemic. That's what I wanted to do. There's no way I planned that. But yet, in God's sovereignty, He knows And every time I go through preaching through a book of the Bible, I get amazed. One of the things that I read this week, brought out by J.D. Greer, the Southern Baptist president at this time, he mentioned something while talking about them having to cancel our big national convention. He began to talk about a plague that happened many, many centuries ago. In A.D. 250, all right, so year 250, In Rome, there was an enormous plague that struck the Roman Empire. This plague was severe. It killed an average of 5,000 people a day. It was a massive plague that went through. And many of them began to talk about this plague and to wonder how they were going to deal with it. But I need you to understand that at this time, in A.D. 250, Christians in the Roman Empire only made up 2% of the entire empire. All the population. That's nothing. 2% is nothing. But listen to what was said by the historians. The bishop of Corinth, Dionysus, said this, Most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to every need and ministering to every ministering to them in Christ, and with them departed this life serenely and happily. Many in nursing and curing others transferred the death to themselves and died in their stead. What the historian said is that in the midst of this plague, the midst of this 5,000 people, is that that little tiny 2% of the population did not hide in seclusion, but literally went out and tried to be the light in all that darkness. To minister unto people and to take care of people out there. 
And then it goes on further, the historian says, talking about those outside the church. He wrote, but with non-Christians, everything was quite otherwise. They deserted those who began to be sick. And they fled from their dearest friends. They shunned any participation or fellowship with the death. Which yet, with all their precautions, it was not easy for them to escape themselves. What he's saying there is that they too would end up dying even though they're doing their best to strive to not to die because the plague was so bad. And they're just abandoning all these people, all their friends, all those that they said they loved and cared about. They abandoned them. But it was the Christians that did it. That actually spent time loving and serving those that were dying. They were the ones that reached out. Once the plague was over, something happened. All of a sudden, when just, in just a short time, that 2% of the population would eventually take over the Roman Empire and become the majority of faith in the Roman Empire. How in the world does that happen? Well, it's simple. When you recover from a disease, are you going to go and worship at the temple where the temple priest abandoned you and all those in the temple had nothing to do with you? Or are you going to serve the one who sat there by your side? Are you going to serve the one of the God that people worshipped that loved you when nobody else would love you? That served you when nobody else wanted anything to do with you? They were willing to be there next to you and encourage you and strengthen you and provide for you. Of course, that's what they did. They all began to go and to serve Jesus Christ because of the light that had been shined in all this darkness. There's a reason why I'm saying this. There's a reason why I'm telling you this this morning. Because I need you to understand that even though we're sitting in a crisis and we're sitting in the midst of a pandemic, I want you to understand how this is going to affect the church. Because that's really what's on a lot of people's minds, especially if you're a Christian. How is this going to affect the church? I've read so many articles where people are saying that this crisis, this is a crisis of the church. How is the church going to survive? Number one, the church is Jesus Christ's bride. It ain't going nowhere. Now some of those that made professions that might be rocky soil or the weedy soil or the crowded soil, they may fall away. But His church is not falling away. Those that have truly put their faith in Christ are going to rise. And now is the time to rise. How is this going to affect the church? Understand that this is not a crisis of the church. The church is not in crisis. This is a crisis that the world is experiencing right now. And now is the time for the church to rise up. If we look in history and we look at all the pandemics and the plagues that have gone through since the church, since Christ, it is the church that rises to the occasion. Most people are worried about the church. Are they going to close the doors forever? I tell you one thing that worries me is I'm wondering how long will it take for the church to rise up? For the true light of Christ to shine in the midst of this darkness. Because right now I see neighbors that are scared. I see people that have now lost every idol they could ever put their hope and faith in. They, guard, they, they take up every piece of toilet paper they can find. They seek out every little thing because they're worried to death about their life. But I tell you, now's the time for the church to rise. Now's not the time for the church to pull back. Now's the time for us to push forward. Now is the time for us to be brave and to step out in faith just like them. Now hear me clearly. I'm not telling you to ignore social distancing. I'm not telling you that at all. I'm not telling you to go and break the law of the government. That's contrary to what Scripture would teach. But I am telling you this. I'm challenging you to figure out how you're going to be the light in this darkness. Because there's ways to doing it. One of the glorious things about being a part here, and I, y'all, just as you read in Scripture, Paul was blessed and he was honored by the good reports coming in from the churches that he had founded and started. I, as the pastor of Shoal Creek, am blessed and encouraged by seeing what so many of the members of Shoal Creek are doing. I see people willing to start Sunday school classes there online. I've seen members actually go even to a crazy old preacher's house to drop off bread. I have had brothers that have grilled ribs and given ribs. 
I've seen people step out and serve more than ever before. I'm seeing it happen. The church is stepping up and the church is doing things. But I know it's not all of us. What would really happen if the entire body of Shoal Creek actually stepped out and started being the light? That every member wouldn't just sit there and take a bread to somebody there in their class, but they would take that bread to the neighbor that they ain't never even met. Or even better yet, the neighbor you can't stand. Who gets mad every time you try to touch his tree that's grown over in your property. What would happen if we actually showed love to those that never have even heard of? What we can do is simply do things like that. When you go to the store, pick up an extra roll of toilet paper and drop it off at your neighbor's house. If we are blessed and you are able to receive money from the stimulus and for some reason you don't really need that money, consider breaking it down into 20s, putting it in an envelope and taping it to your neighbor's door. Be a blessing to them. Be an encouragement to them. You can simply drop off. Here at the church, what we do is we have a nice little card that says, we want you to know today that Jesus loves you. Throw that in there with it. That they know why you're doing it. Because we serve the light of this world. We serve one that has changed our life. And so what I would love for the body of Shoal Creek to simply listen well right now in particular to this. When this crisis is over and you hear me well it's going to end when this crisis is over what is prideful going to say about show creek well they consider us the ones that just took tail and hid they just whined and complained or they see us step up and be the light of this world to share the light of christ As He has changed our lives. For us to step out and actually do what Jesus Christ said. To be bold enough that those who are willing to lose their life will actually find life. Be bold with your faith. Come up with ways to figure out how to abide by the law of this land. And protect yourself. But also at the same time be bold enough to reach out to those that desperately need to hear about Christ. That does not need to hear about Jesus but they need to feel it and see it. Because I want to remind you again that when it came to the leper there in the beginning of Mark's gospel, Jesus touched him before he ever gave him a command. Let us touch those that are around us. I really believe this is the time right now where Show Creek can step up. And I really believe now is the time. I, I, like in the story of Esther, it says such is a time as this. That's why you're here. I believe one of the reasons why I'm here isn't by accident, it isn't by mistake. I believe God wanted me here for this purpose and reason. And I believe each and every one of you are here for this purpose and this reason. It's just will you step up and share the light of Christ. Because I promise you, He didn't call you here He didn't set you here and plant you here to hide you under a basket. It's not why He put you here. He didn't put you here to cower in your homes. He put you here to be a light. And step out in boldness. Next, I want you to hear the great promise. So this is number two. Christ wants us to hear the great promise out of these parables. Read with me in verses 24 and 25. And he was saying to them, take care what you listen to. By your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. And more will be given to you besides. For whoever has, to him more shall be given. And whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Now, reading this, I have to be honest with you. Sometimes I can be really simple-minded. And when I read passages like that, I'm thinking, what in the world is he talking about? Right now, Jesus, I need you to pause and explain it to this dumb disciple. You did it to Paul, I mean, not Paul, but Peter and all the others. Now it's my time. Explain this to me. Well, here's one of the wonderful things. If you will just simply sit down and study Scripture, He will explain it to you. The truth is there if you will dig deep enough to find it. What Christ is talking about here is Himself. Talking about His Word, what He is teaching us. He's talking about faith. 
And I want you to hear this. When you go about listening and talking about faith, how is it that you get faith? As a pastor, I hear that question all the time. How do I get faith or how do I grow in faith? Listen. It's the reason why I say it before I speak or preach any sermon or message. In Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says this. So faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. I say that before I ever preach a message. Because it's in the hearing that you'll get faith. It's in the hearing that you'll hear the Word of God. I tell people all the time that you do not try to sober the drunk up and then get him to church. Get the drunk in church and let God sober him up. Because it's His Word that will break through. Y'all, I was drunk to the point to where most people, I couldn't even hardly have a conversation. But I promise you, I remember a lot of the messages that were spoke while I was in an inebriated state in his body. His word has a power breaking through. I wasn't even planning on telling this story, but it's actually a funny story. So y'all, got re- y'all ready for this one? Of course you are. You're not going to say no, are you? One of the times when I was really, I had already lost my job as a surgical assistant, and it's before I really went into rehab the first time. We kept getting seminary packets in the mail. Seminary packets. Now, y'all, my wife had to drag me to church kicking and screaming. Why in the world are seminary packets coming in the mail? And I'm, y'all, it's coming constantly. And it's from all over. I mean, the Methodists, Episcopalian, Presbyterians, Baptists, galore. I'm getting all these seminary packets to fill out. I'm thinking, what in the world? My wife couldn't figure it out either. Why are these things coming in the mail? I didn't have a clue. Well, we found out why. My wife came home early one day from work, and of course, I was drunk again. But this time, I was passed out in a chair in front of the computer. And do you know what was on the computer screen? A seminary. And what I was doing in my drunken stupor is I'm applying to seminaries. (laughs) And that's why these packets kept coming in the mail. Now, some of you are thinking, what in the world are you trying to say? What I'm saying is this. Even in my drunken state, Christ was trying to break through. Even in my drunken state, I knew what Christ was wanting to do in my heart. I really believe one of the reasons I fought so hard and fell so deep and so dark for so long is because I knew deep down what He wanted me to do, and I just didn't want to do it. And I fought that call in my life. I'm telling you, Christ will awaken us through the hearing of the Word and faith. He also said in Galatians 3, 2, Did you not receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? It ain't by the works that saves you. It's by what you heard, the gospel truth that awakens your soul. In 1 Thessalonians 2.13, he said, And we also thank God continually because when you received the Word of God, which you heard from us, You accepted it, not as human word, but as it actually is, a word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. Y'all, it's what you hear. It comes through the ear. That's why I titled this message, Listen Up. It is critical what you listen to. It is critical what you study. Don't believe anybody that tells you it don't matter what you read or what you're listening to. That's garbage. If you take in garbage, guess what's going to come out? garbage I'm telling you but if you take in God's blessed truth it's going to start growing it's going to start doing something it's going to start producing fruit and good I love what he said there at the end of that verse in Thessalonians he says which indeed at work in you who believe it ain't a one time work it's a continual work Christ saved me I am redeemed hallelujah I'm redeemed I'm justified. Thank God I'm justified. And I'm sanctified. And one day I'm going to be glorified. But in that sanctified position, I'm also on a journey of sanctification. I'm growing closer to Christ. It's a continual work in our lives. So He is growing and He is working in us. But here's the promise, because I know a lot of you are saying, wait a minute, that second point said it's a great promise. What's the promise? Here it is. In verse 24, he said, Take care what you listen to by your standard of measure to be measured to you. 
and more will be given to you besides. For whoever has, to him more shall be given. What Jesus Christ is saying is, if you'll listen to what I'm telling you and what I'm giving you, my word, my truth, I'm going to give you more. More than what you could ever put into it. Your little tiny mustard seed of faith is going to be able to move a mountain that's in your life. You're going to do things that the world cannot believe or understand. You're going to have amazing power and gifts. You're going to grow leaps and bounds far more than whatever you put into it. Because understand that this sounds an awful like, a lot like what the world has always taught us. There's a saying that was given to me a long time ago. What you put into something is what you're going to get out of it. How many of you have ever heard that? Y'all, that's a true saying. What you put into it, you're going to get out of it. I tell my football players all the time, if you don't put no effort into practice, you ain't going to get nothing out of practice. And you're going to ride the pine bench. That's what you're going to do. If you don't study in school, guess what? You're probably not going to graduate. But you're not going to get anything out of it if you don't put something into it. Same goes for your job, everything, your marriage, your children, everything in this life, it tells you all the time, and it's a truth, that what you put in is what you're going to get out. But not when it comes to faith in Jesus Christ. It's different. And listen to the promise. His promise says this, what you put into it isn't what you're going to get out of it. What you put in, I'm going to give you more. It's grace. It's abundant life. You're only going to put in a little effort. And what little effort you put in, I'm going to keep pouring it out. You're going to sit there and you're going to study for 15 minutes His Word. And in that 15 minutes, He's going to give you a life worth of growth. He's going to pour truth into you. You're going to serve 15 minutes at church or 30 minutes in church or God bless the worship team that's here with me right now an hour and a half at church and I'm going to bless you for a lifetime with my gospel truth because you're listening to it. And I want to grow you in ways that nothing else can grow you. That's what I'm wanting you to do and that is the promise. Understand that Christ says you're going to get far more out of this faith than what you're ever going to put into it. Far more. Again, what was the parable of the good soul? 30, 60, 100 fold? Impossible. But that's the promise He gives us for those who actually listen. Those that are willing to serve. Those that are willing to grow in His Word. And understand me, that's what we're supposed to do. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. To equip the saints for the works of ministry and to build up the body of Christ. My job as the pastor is to equip you to do what? Ministry. That's what you're supposed to do. I don't cast the light of Christ to a body of believers and His blessed truth so that they can just sit there on a pew and do nothing. You don't receive a light to put under a basket. You're to let it grow. And you're to let it shine. You're to allow the light of Christ to shine through you. And if you will put in your part, your study, your just diligence to serve Him and His body as He's commanded us to do, He is going to bless beyond. And I will give you this. Again, it's by the power of our testimony we'll overcome the darkness of this world. The great, if you ever really want to learn Scripture... Teach a class. You will learn more than you ever dreamed you would. And I'm telling you, you could simply sit there. Ben, I know you serve with the children. Even when you serve the children, you learn just to be able to teach them. Even in a children's lesson. Miss Shannon, you're probably smarter than I am. Because you answer some of the hardest questions that come. Children ask hard questions. It's because they're brave enough to ask. You will grow so much. And I want you to understand that if we will actually do what he says here, apply the gifts and the truth and the blessing that you have received, I'm going to give you more. And that's a promise that this world cannot give you. This world can't give it to you, but Christ does. 
And I promise you, anybody that's ever truly sat time and studied his word and served as he has called us to serve will never look you in the eye and say it wasn't worth it. It's always more. And that's the promise. Lastly, the warning. Jesus gives a warning. In verse 25 is where we find the warning. And whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. The warning is clear. The warning is, if you don't use what he's given you, if you don't apply what you have heard, if you really didn't listen with your ears, and you do nothing with it, you're going to lose it all. That's a warning. And it's a warning he repeats all throughout Scripture in multiple other parables. I'll give you the parable of the virgins, the ones that did not prepare what happened? I'll give you the parable of the talents. There, the talents. The, Jesus told the story where a man gave out talents, different measures of talents to his servants. The two first ones that received, they did something with it, and he blessed them. He said, welcome into my household, faithful servants. But the last one did nothing with the talent that Christ had given him. What happened? He lost it all. That is the one teaching He constantly says that if you will do something with this wonderful gift that I've given you, if you will really listen, if you will really believe, and you will step out in faith, I'm going to bless you greater than you've ever dreamed of being blessed. But if you do nothing with this, you're going to lose it all. And that's the lesson that's repeated constantly throughout Scripture. The unforgiving servant received an amazing amount of forgiveness and he wasn't willing to share forgiveness with the one who just barely wronged him. He lost it all. It's the same lesson over and over and over again. Why does he keep saying it over and over again? Because we are not very good listeners. So he has to teach us. Jesus said in Luke 6, 38, For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Listen to what he has said here in this passage. Y'all, there is such a great truth here. He is truly the light of the world. And he has given us amazing gifts. His scripture, scripture is referred to as a treasure. A treasure so great that it's referred to as a pearl of great price that the dude went and sold everything he had just to have it. We have this wonderful treasure right now. Uh, one of my dear sisters put on a comment on social media that since we've not been able to gather, they're missing the body of Christ more than they ever dreamed they would. And I'm the same way. It utterly breaks my heart to walk into this empty church. I miss the people God's put me around. I miss the people that He's called me to serve. Right now, we have a wonderful treasure. What are you doing with it? What are you doing with this gospel? What are you doing? With the light He's given you. To the people He's given you to serve and to love and to take care of. The neighbors He's put there right beside you. Your co-workers, your family, your friends. The dude down the street you hate. What are you doing for them? Right now is our chance to shine. Right now is our chance to do what Christ has called us to do. And so, in closing, I simply want to ask you the question. How are you going to be the light? How are you going to do exactly what Jesus Christ has called you to do? Because every one of us has an opportunity. Every one of you, Christ will give you an opportunity to be the light right now in the darkest moment in most people's lives. Because we hadn't seen something like this since the 1918. Now is the time for us to shine in this generation. And I truly believe that Shoal Creek can really come out of this showing the light of Christ greater than it ever has before. Or we can take this light and put it under a basket. We can take this gift and do nothing with it. But don't forget the warning. We end up losing it all. Now's the time. Will you pray with me about this? Father, I come to you and I ask that you Bless the reading of Your Word and the teaching of Your Word. That, Father, that they will receive this blessed gospel truth. 
They won't just hear and throw it away. But Father, they will actually allow it to take deep root in their hearts and that they will strive to share Your blessed Gospel truth, the light of the world, the life of man. And go into this world in the midst of this dark crisis in ways that will leave everyone in awe and do exactly what You said that will bring glory unto the Father in heaven. Father, may priceful and all the surrounding communities and Hartzell and Decatur all of them know what you've done in the lives of the believers at Show Creek those that are listening by way of internet now that's not even a part of our body Father if they call upon the name of Christ give them the courage and the boldness to be light in this dark world that desperately needs to see it today help them remember the blessed truth that you'll bless it. Any effort that they do will be nothing compared to the blessings you're going to pour upon it. Because you're the one that gives growth. You're the one that causes them to bear fruit. Father, help them to remember that this blessed light comes to be exposed, and not to be hidden. Let us not fail to hide this light. Because we'll lose it all. Now's our time. May we shine for the glory of Christ and His kingdom alone. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. During this time of invitation, while you are at your home, I would love for you to just simply take the time to pray and to search your heart. Search your heart to see as this Christ truly is in you. Do you have that light? Do you know Him as your Lord and your Savior? Have you given your life over to Him and to serve Him, to know the blessed truth that He gave His life there on the cross of Calvary for your sins and mine? And if we would repent and put our faith in Him, He will make us into new creation. Maybe today you'll do that. If you do, please reach out to us. Let us know how we can minister and rejoice with you. How we can disciple you. There are so many wonderful servants here at Show Creek that want to serve you and to teach you. Please take the time to let us know. Please come and let us disciple you. Maybe you just need to pray about how you're sharing the light. What you've done with the light of the gospel. Maybe he saved you 50 years ago, 10 years ago. Or even right now, what are you going to do with this life? How are you going to reach this world? Now's the time to see. Listen to a faithful song from our faithful worship team. And that will be the close of our service. Brother. How lovely is your dwelling place.
Don't forget, hashtag Show Creek United. We'll see you the same time next week.